The following presentation was recorded at the 2011 Southeast Linux Fest in Spartanburg, South Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond and platinum sponsors in 2011 for helping make these videos possible. PC, BSD is going, etc. Because I know a lot of people in the Linux world that are familiar with BSD but not necessarily running it and knowing what's going on there. First of all, show of hands, how many people have actually run FreeBSD? Okay, so there's a fair amount. PCBSD? Okay, so we got a couple as well. Okay, excellent. So some of this may be you know, old hat to you, you may have heard this, but then some of the new stuff at the end you'll want to stick around for because we'll talk about where we're going with PCBSD. So the first question I always get asked when I come to a Linux conference is, what is PCBSD? And there are a couple things we need to answer first. First of all, what is BSD? Because that's usually what somebody's really asking. And a couple of my favorite things I like to answer. First of all, it's not a fork of Linux. The first question I get usually is, what distribution are you? Are you based off of SUSE or Red Hat or Ubuntu? I mean, where'd you come from? We're not a flavor of Linux, and we're not a distribution. So that you know, gets people thinking a little differently here. This is not Linux. But what BSD is, we are a branch of Unix derived from the original AT&T Unix back in the late 70s. So that's where our, our roots come from. What makes it a little different than Linux is that we're a complete operating system as opposed to just a kernel of packages. When you install FreeBSD or any of the BSDs such as Open or Net or Dragonfly, you have your kernel plus your user land included. It's not just a kernel with a bunch of packages for your bin utils, et cetera. All that stuff's built into the operating system. So you can load FreeBSD on a box have no packages installed whatsoever and still have a fully functional system you can SSH into and do all the, all the server type stuff before you even uh, load any packages. It's released under a different style license than Linux. I know this is something that some people know about, others don't. I'm gonna touch on this briefly here. So why don't we go ahead and swerve into this one first and just get it out of the way because this seems to be a big difference between BSD and Linux and some people are okay with it, some aren't. First thing I want to point out is this is the FreeBSD license, in case you have not seen it recently. And in here lies kind of the division between the communities. The FreeBSD license is very simple. You're looking at the whole thing right here. It's two clauses, basically, which just say, please include our copyright in it. And then, please don't sue us if something goes wrong. That, that's pretty much all it is, to stay compliant with the BSD license. By comparison, the GPL has tended to grow over the years. This is a copy of the GPL3. And yeah, it's just a tad bit longer. Okay, so you know, why do I show this to you? This is just to make a point in the difference in philosophy between the two communities. The BSD community, of which PCBSD is a part of, we release all our source and code and binaries under the FreeBSD license, which basically says you do whatever you want with it. We put no restrictions on you whatsoever. We don't want you to have to deal with lawyers, have to worry about being in compliance. It's yours, have fun. Just include our copyright if you use it. That's it. You know, you're not going to get sued later because you didn't comply with the FreeBSD license, most likely. It's pretty hard to break. Um, the GPL, on the other hand, it, it imposes restrictions. You have to do certain things to stay in compliance. And I know this is kind of a sticky thing if some of you guys are big Linux fans. That's a, some people say that is an advantage. It's keeping it free. It's in the open. FreeBSD, BSD, yes, you could close source it. Companies have done that. We view that as a strength. It gets more of our software out there in the open. People are using it even if you don't know it. I mean. When you turn on a device, you don't know if it's running BSD under the hood. It may be. But we're getting our stuff out in the public and being used no matter what form it ends up taking. We're not going to put restrictions on what you do with it. And we don't want to. That's not our, our goal. So that's, you know, that's the big, one of the biggest differences between the two in philosophy anyway. I mean, there's a whole bunch of other things as far as how system development is done, how the community is organized. But we're not doing a talk just on FreeBSD today. We're going to go into some other stuff as well. But where basically FreeBSD came from is it's still a descendant of the original BSD Unix. It's a complete operating system, as I said, for running all your third-party applications via ports, packages. What it's used most often for is for hosting. Servers, Apache, you know, file servers, FreeNAS, if any of you went to the talk based on FreeBSD. You're seeing it in a lot of embedded devices, places where you wouldn't expect. You find out, oh, Yahoo's running FreeBSD, or oh, NASA's running FreeBSD. You know, it's in those type of environments, whether you know it or not. 
It's also able to build and run most of the same stuff you see under Linux. There are open source POSIX operating systems, so you're gonna see Apache, you'll see X, KDE, Firefox, OpenOffice, LibreOffice, I mean, you name it, probably any open source package out there has already been ported to FreeBSD at some point, because I think their port tree is like 25,000 packages in it right now. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that just runs on FreeBSD. Some things it does different, we have some native features such as ZFS from the Solaris guys, that's in FreeBSD. Some stuff called Jelly, which is for your Geom encryption layers, so you can encrypt file systems, encrypt ZFS, et cetera. Those are some things just built right into FreeBSD. And another thing most people don't realize is we run Linux. In other words, we can run Linux binaries in FreeBSD without emulation. It's just a compatibility layer which runs Linux apps at normally just full speed. I mean, you don't notice a difference. In some cases, we've been told it's faster on FreeBSD because our kernel may be optimized in a different way than on the Linux kernel. So just, you know, your mileage may vary, depends on what you're doing, but that is something we can do. So now that we have kind of an idea what FreeBSD is, well, how does PCBSD relate to this? Well, first of all, it's a desktop version of FreeBSD. It's not a fork. That's one common misconception we hear is, oh, you're based off of FreeBSD, you know, when you started five years ago or whatever. Well, no, we're still based off of FreeBSD. We're 100% compatible. We're not a fork. We are not taking their code and changing it. When you install PCBSD, you are installing FreeBSD, essentially, on your system. So just to clear up any confusion there, it's 100% compatible. And yes, we come up with changes to FreeBSD, but we submit them back and get them in the FreeBSD tree usually pretty quickly. So it's not like we're forking off there. It just basically comes with your pre-built desktop packages. So in the case of PCBSD 8.2 and previous releases, we'll have X and KDE pre-installed, loaded, just ready to go out of the box. So the moment you boot up, you get what looks like just any other you know, Linux distro, SUS or Red Hat or whatever ones you're using KDE nowadays or have that option. That's what it'll look like at first glance. Most people mistake it for that. It's, an, it's initialized for the desktop environment, so we also include some things such as Flash and the binary NVIDIA drivers. We have support for those on uh, FreeBSD, both in the 32-bit and 64-bit varieties, and we ship those with the package, or with the operating system, just to make it easier for end users. So what do we do different than, than FreeBSD? We have some own custom utilities here as well. FreeBSD currently their installer. If anyone has installed FreeBSD in the last couple of years, you remember it's the text-based installation. It's your console. Kind of like what the FreeNAS installer looked like if you were in that talk. It's just a couple of text things. But it doesn't support some of the cool new features that FreeBSD does, such as ZFS, mirroring, gelling, uh, labeling your file systems, et cetera. They are working on adding those, but we beat them to the punch, and we already have that in our installer. So PCBSD can take advantage of all those features. Another cool thing we did is we added the ability to install FreeBSD or PCBSD from our installation medium. We figured, oh, since we have all these cool features that FreeBSD doesn't have you know, the built-in support for for their uh, installer, why don't we just give a checkbox that says load FreeBSD or load PCBSD and you can take advantage of the same features. Um, supports installing from DVD, USB, network, live. I mean, it's pretty standard as far as that stuff goes. This is what you'll be presented with when you boot PCBSD as opposed to a text-based menu. You'll come up to a nicely, you know, nice little GUI here that makes it very simple to get your operating system installed. Here would be an example of our disk partition page. So in this case, uh, you know, pretty standard. You got your file system options, so ZFS. UFS is the default on FreeBSD, but in this example, we're doing ZFS for a bigger system. Use the entire disk. FreeBSD does some different naming for their devices here. So dev AD0 be your IDE device, serial ATA, et cetera. Oh, excuse me. Um, we have options for encrypting user data. It's real, we try to keep everything simple in PCBSD. So, you know, jelly encryption, for example. FreeBSD, if you look up a how-to on how to do that, you may get a wiki page with 12 commands. You gotta do all this, this, and this to set it up. We just simplify it, one checkbox, enable, don't enable, and then it does all the magic in the background for you. Yeah. It, bo it boots it automatically when you boot up the DVD. It just brings up the GUI. So. Oh, you boot it into a command line? Well, yeah, show me that afterwards. I'd be curious to see it. But. Oh, yeah, oh, sorry about that. Yeah, he was asking how do you boot into the GUI from the uh, DVD. And it should automatically just boot into it, but if it dumps you to a command prompt, usually one of two things has happened. Somehow XORG failed to start, and it'll dump you back to a command prompt to see what's going on. 
Um, or, I don't know, I'll have to take a look and see. That's usually the case. So, um, anyway, so that's our disk setup. We support GPT as well. It's another feature I've neglected to mention. So if you're dealing with a large disk, two terabytes or greater in size, we can do GPT installations on that. And another feature we have added to it to make PCBSD more usable is we have network management GUIs. FreeBSD, your network management GUI is VI. VI, the WPA supplicant file. And if you've never done that before, boy, are you in for a treat. That is a lot of fun. <laughs> so, we didn't want to go through all that hassle, so we wrote our own custom GUIs, which just allow you to set up your wired wireless networking, support for IPv4, v6, some cool features like lag failover, so if you're on a laptop, you can unplug your wired connection and keep surfing and not lose your downloads and, you know, keep on doing what you're doing. It'll automatically fail over to the wireless device. This would be an example of what this looks like in PCBSD, just a network manager. Our network devices will be named based on the type of driver they are, so EM0, uh, ATH0, et cetera. It varies depending on your hardware. But it'll detect them and then provide you with some options to set them up. In this case here, we're looking at, we're setting up our DNS, host name, you know, IPv6 if we're going to use it, et cetera. Another thing we've added to PCBSD is a system management utility, which comes in useful for a variety of ways, especially for developers. First of all, is an easy way to get the FreeBSD sources. If you're not familiar with CVS or SVN or how to do that or which mirror to get it from because there's a ton of them, we can go ahead and do the checkout for you. We have port snap support, which in FreeBSD land, we have the ports tree. You have RPMs and other files on Linux. Well, we have ports and packages, and this can allow you to uh, grab the FreeBSD ports tree and do that kind of work. Uh, and a little feature I put in there for fun is tech support sheets. So when we get X users saying, hey, my card X doesn't work, send me a support sheet. I can view all the system information and find out what's really going on. And this is what this GUI would look like, for example. There's a whole bunch of different tabs here for different options. But I just wanted to show you one here, checking out the system sources. The source is broken up into a bunch of different things. You'll have your system for the kernel, your bin, et cetera, and you can choose what you want there. Another way in which PCBSD is greatly different from FreeBSD is we also have our own packaging system. Now, this is, this is a topic we're going to spend some time on here in a little bit. But uh, we've invent, or I've invented a package system called PBI, which is Push Button Installer. Um, some of you may have heard of my story of why I decided to write this. But back in the day when I was starting PCBSD, I was running a lot of Linux distros. I was back on Mandrake and Lindos and Red Hat and you know, a variety of them. And it seemed like, you know, especially I had thrown in my wife's system, et cetera, it seemed like my weekends bit ended up being eaten up by installing updates. Well, I'd go update X app, and now it has to update 20 other apps, which, oh, those need an update too. And if I'm really lucky, nothing will break, and I can keep working. And more often than not, it seemed like I ended up having breakage, or something would change, the desktop doesn't work properly now. Some other apps affected that it shouldn't have been, but it was, you know. I understand that's just how it works, but... And that has gotten better over the years, but I just wanted to avoid that whole mess. So I just decided to write something different, similar to how Mac OS X does their packages, how Windows does it, where everything's self-contained. We're not installing files all over the directories, all over the operating system, just everywhere where they can manipulate and touch other files, potentially, and break things. So everything's self-contained. This introduces a layer keeping the operating system separate from the applications. So if you're on Linux or even FreeBSD using ports and packages, and say you set up a desktop with KDE. Well, KDE requires like 2.8 million dependencies, I think, now. And that is your entire operating system and desktop. And if you want to make a change to one of those, who knows how many other ones you're going to manipulate. We wanted to have that separate. You install PCBSD, and then you go grab Firefox or LibreOffice or whatever. Those install, and they don't touch any of your KDE stuff. They don't mess with them. There's no risk of potentially breaking them when you remove them. If you install Firefox and then install KOffice, they don't intermingle at all and don't touch each other. That was a goal I wanted, just to avoid that, the potential for breakage. The way, the way I can best phrase it is it's kind of like a spider web. If you pull one piece, you don't know how many other ones you're gonna pull. Well, in this one, you pull the one piece out, it's not connected to anything else. It's not touching anything. And this was to provide stability for you know, my wife or your mom or just anybody who's not computer savvy, you just, you don't want to have to fix that for them. You just want them to be able to get on the computer and use it. Yeah? Um, 
it is self, um, the question was, does that mean the PBIs are statically linked and self-contained? They are self-contained, but they're not usually statically linked. They're dynamically linked, including the libraries within them. I'll talk about why we do that a little bit later and how we use that for some uh, optimization. But uh, yes, they do include all the libraries, so the PBI will end up being larger than, say, an RPM file because it has all the libs built into it. But if you took a fresh system and installed that same RPM, you'd end up sucking in all those libraries anyway. So the size will come out the same in that respect. But we'll talk about how that works in a minute and how we've updated that. And I kind of mentioned this already. It's just based on the philosophy that's a little different, that applications are not your operating system. Your operating system is your operating system. Firefox should not be screwing with your operating system. I mean. The last thing I want to do is install a new web browser and then waste my day and my weekend trying to figure out why something else changed or broke. That's just something I'm not into. Um, everything self-contained doesn't change your system packages. And just a visual representation of this. So we'll just assume for a second here this is Linux. This could be FreeBSD. It doesn't really matter in this case. But there's your, tr your traditional open source packaging model. Everything is dependent on everything else and the tree can get very big and tangled very quickly. This is your PCVSD model. Base system, which is FreeBSD in this case, desktop, which KDE or whatever, and then your applications. Only relying on the base system, so we do rely on something, which is just the major version of FreeBSD, whatever that is, so eight or nine or whatnot. But then the apps don't touch one another. They're self-contained. So some current information about PCDSD. Right now we're at version 8.2. We track the FreeBSD releases. So PCBSD 8.2 will be based on FreeBSD 8.2, and 9 will be based on 9, etc. Um, 8.2 includes KDE 4.5.5 as the default desktop. This was released about five, six months ago now, so that was what we had at the time and uh, had working well. However, we're going to be making some changes to 9, and this is what some of you who have used PCBSD are probably going to want to hear. First thing we've done, first major change, is we are no longer KDE centric. We have had Probably the biggest hindrance to adoption of PCBSD has been, oh, I love the OS, I like the idea, I like FreeBSD. Gosh, I hate KDE. You know, can you put something else on it? And of course, everyone has a different opinion of what that something else would be, so it's not as simple as just switching us to GNOME and expecting everyone to be happy, because then you get the same crowd on the other side going, oh, I just hate GNOME, I can't use it, whatever it is. So we decided to go to a window manager agnostic model. So we will be offering multiple window managers, and I'll show you a little bit of that here in a second. But this required us redoing all of our utilities, decoupling them all from KDE. They are all written in pure uh, Qt. And then re-implementing our PBI system, because that was written in Qt and KDE as well. So we had to go back to the drawing board and just decouple everything and make it agnostic to whatever your particular window manager is. And that's pretty much what I mentioned here. Um, how this works, though, during the installation, the installer is now going to offer window manager meta packages is what we've termed them. And that's just basically a way of saying, I want to install GNOME, and it, that list will have all the various packages that make up GNOME, or KDE, or XFCE, or you know, LXDE, et cetera. There's going to be a variety of them. And then the cool thing with this is, is post-installation, you can then add and remove these again through the system manager. So say you get your system loaded up, you put KDE4 on it. You give it a go for a week and go, wow, this really isn't for me. That was a bad choice. You can just go into the system manager and say, deleted, add whatever else. I want to try something else, and it'll just do it for you. So currently, what we're looking at targeting offering for 9 will be KDE 4 series, GNOME 2. I'm hearing that GNOME 3 probably won't be ported over until after 9.0 for FreeBSD. XFCE and then LXDE. Those are going to be our four main ones that we call the supported window managers. And what I mean by that is those are where we're going to be spending the time optimizing them, make sure all the settings work, and you know, just things work as expected out of box. However, we are going to offer a variety of unsupported window managers, which are a lot more bare bones ones that you know, only the brave at heart usually run or people really know what they're doing. So that'll be your awesomes, enlightenments, you know, window maker, flux box. And yeah, <laughs> so if there's any, any other smaller ones out there, I'm sure there's you know, a zillion of them that I'm messing, right? Do you have one? Open box? Uh, I haven't added it, but it's in the tree. I could add it. Those are the kind of things I was going to mention. If there are other window managers you would like to see this run, drop me an email. Usually it takes me 20 minutes to put it in, and it's just there. Again, it won't be supported. We're not going to officially go out of our way to make everything work, but it'll be there so you can run it and you know, go about your business and do your thing with it. 
And this is what it'll look like now in the installer. So in this case, we've finished all the disks set up, and now we're going to pick our system packages. So you have some different categories, your base development tools, which are like your SVN tools, Git, et cetera. And then GNOME 2, KDE 4, and there's a bunch more down at the bottom. And you just pick which ones you want, and it customizes the system for you and throws it on the disk. In the hardware drivers as well, that's where you can pick like your NVIDIA binary driver if you're running NVIDIA, et cetera, or HP for printers and whatnot. And post-installation in our system tool, you get the exact same menu. So anything you did there, you're not locked into permanently. You decide, oh, I want to bail on this one or add this one. It's just a checkbox. You click it, it does it. It'll pull it from the mirrors or it'll ask you to insert the DVD and just pull it off the packages there. So pretty simple. A big thing we've done is improved our control panel. One of the things we had to do when decoupling from KDE was we were using KDE system settings utility before, which is their control panel. And obviously, if KDE is not installed, we can't rely on that. So we wrote our own control panel, which is agnostic to the particular window manager. It's going to be consistent. It looks the same between window managers, so we can document it and say, here's where your sound settings always are, regardless of your window manager. Here's where your network settings always are, et cetera. And we have some cool things where it can detect the running window manager and show appropriate icons for that, too. So say you're running a... I think I have a picture of it here. You're running LXDE. I don't know if you can see it up in the corner here, but the LXDE icon is automatically selected, and then it brings up some special things for the LXD keyboard config, et cetera. Yeah? GNOME 3 will probably not be until 9.1. Um, 9, uh, the question, by the way, was which, what about GNOME 3? But yeah, GNOME 3 um, is still being ported, but because of some of the new things that rely on Linux specifically that we have to wait and get ported into FreeBSD, I'm hearing probably not till 9.1, because it, it changed significantly. So uh, we're going to ship with GNOME 2 by default, and then when 9.1 comes out six months later, GNOME 3 will probably be in that. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, FreeBSD has a uh, question was, what, how do we do Linux packages? How do you run those natively? Well, Linux compatibility is installed by default on PCBSD, and that's actually how we do some things like the Flash plugin. Adobe only releases the Linux binaries. They don't release BSD natives at this point. So we use NS plugin wrapper and then wrap the, the Linux binary. So the Linux compatibility is there. If you can download a command line app and just run it, it may just run. Otherwise, the utilities are there where you can do the RPM commands and, and install it, and it goes into a special compat Linux directory, and then you have your regular Linux tree there. Correct. Um, the Linux, yeah, the Linux stuff's in its own directory, not to touch the rest of your working system. So, the way, worst you could break your Flash, you know, but you couldn't break necessarily your desktop or window manager and whatnot. So, um, this is also just so you can see here. We had the option, so if you're going to switch window managers, you can peek at what other icons we have available for those window managers and switch to them. So one of the things I mentioned we had to re-implement was the PBI system, because of it being written in QT and KDE 4, it just was not going to work on 9 without KDE installed, and, you know, GNOME puts things in different places, and et cetera. So we had to go back to the drawing board on this one. So we tried to address several things. While we're here, if we're going to redo it, let's redo it right. So the first thing we did is it was a tacked-on CLI interface before. It was all QT-based, so the, you know, the command line stuff was kind of kludgy. So I decided, well, that's got to be fixed. We're going to go full command line with this. Another thing was the PBIs were not sharing libraries in this other system. So if you down had loaded Firefox and Thunderbird, they had their own separate libraries. They didn't share them, which was a waste of disk space and RAM runtime space as well. So I wanted to find a way to fix that. Um, we didn't have a big distribution infrastructure. We just had a website where you could go download things, but it wasn't really integrated as well as it could be digital signatures, and uh, something a lot of people mentioned in other countries, especially where the internet speeds aren't that good, was the file updates were pretty large. You know, PBI may be a lot bigger than your RPM, and I don't want to download this whole package just to get a small update. So how did we solve these? Well, the first thing, everything in PBI now is implemented in shell. I mean, it's very simple, so everything is available via the command line. And there's a variety of commands. There's like 15 different commands you can run to access all the aspects of the PBI system. So PBI browser, repo, add, et cetera. And I'll talk a little bit about what those do here in a minute. But the biggest thing was the library sharing. Since we didn't want to be wasting disk space and RAM space anymore, I had to figure out a way. How do we share these? And I, I 
forget who suggested it, but at one point it came up, well, why aren't we using hard links to some kind of advantage here to make this all work? So I came up with a system that uses something we call the hashter, where we keep track of hard links and keep track of checksums so we know which libraries are identical. So you can install a version that uses X version of GTK and then another version of GTK side by side and they don't overwrite or clobber one another. They can coexist peacefully and then you can still share those libraries with other apps that use the identical library. And this reduces our disk and runtime memory usage because it's all hard linked. It looks at it in FreeBSD by inode and says, oh, I have that library in memory now. I don't need to load another copy of it even though it's in a physical different location on the disk uh, or it looks like it is. And then we track matches with SHA-256 checksums and we have a daemon that I wrote that monitors and manages that, just makes sure everything's in a sane format and where it should be and not being messed with, et cetera. And here's, here's kind of how this works, just a visual representation, this may help. So say we have two PBIs here, it could be anything, we'll say Firefox and Thunderbird, and we go ahead and install, and we notice they have two libraries, libfoo, and the checksums on them are identical. This will all be, pre um, when you build the PBI, it calculates those checksums, so we'll know what they are ahead of time. So the daemon is gonna run through and go, okay, here's a library, let's put this in the hashter, and it, it puts it in there with the checksum appended to the end of the file name, so we can keep track of what it is. It then gets to the second PBI and says, oh, hey, cool, this library is in the hasher already with the right checksum. We have a match. We can remove the original library from the PBI and just hard link it in there, and we can monitor the hard link count. Now, suppose later we've updated Thunderbird and it has a different checksum now. It just gets another copy of the library in the hasher with its own hash, and we can hard link to that with newer versions of the PBI that use that newer library. So say you delete Firefox now, and now that old library is orphaned and then the hash count or the uh, hard link count would drop to one in this case. The daemon will go, oh, we have an orphan library here. We don't need this anymore. It's time to remove it. And we have eliminated that library, but it could be re-added later. If you go and add an older application in that needs that library, it'll just throw it right back in for you and you keep on going your way. Any questions on that real quick? So that's usually where I get a lot of questions. Yeah. Correct. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, I wrote it so that it runs on native FreeBSD as well. So it is in the FreeBSD port stream, people are using it there. Potentially it could be used on Linux or elsewhere. I mean, if somebody wants to port it over, it does rely on a couple BSD commands and whatnot, but I'm sure porting wouldn't be that difficult. They're looking at using it for the new FreeNAS system, for FreeNAS 8.1, and that'll be the format they use for plugging in extensions into FreeNAS. But uh, yeah, it is pretty portable. I mean, it's just a shell, big shell script that does everything. It's, it's pretty simple. So yeah, it could be definitely portable. So, oh, one thing I didn't mention too was because everything is self-contained now, you can actually install apps as a user. You don't need to give people root access. So we have the group directory, if you're familiar with how OSX does their applications, it's group writable for operators. And so if you add a user and give them operator's permission, they can install apps without having to go and get the root password from you. So you could potentially install a desktop, give it to mom, and say, here you go, have fun, don't even tell her the root password, and she can still get on, add her applications, do whatever she needs to, without getting into damaging areas of the system that you would need root for in that case. So there's some cool things you can do like that. Another thing somebody brought up that I hadn't even thought about was, oh, I can NFS export this entire PBI directory to 20 machines, and they can all run the apps right off of this, this directory here. They're self-contained, they're all running the same version of PCBSD, why not? Yeah, sure you can. So I mean, it does open up some intriguing possibilities. You can, you can mess with this in a couple different ways. But uh, I'll go ahead and, and move on now to how we did the distribution fixes. Well, first of all, we wanted, when I wrote this, I wanted to create a way where it's easy to distribute PBIs to the end users. On 8.2 and on previous, we've had a website called PBI Dur, which is just a nice web front end, and you can go and download and browse and get your apps and install them. But I wanted something a little better. I wanted something that was integrated with digital signatures. So we have done that now, where it digitally signs all the PBIs, and we are now setting up a repository system. And by repository, what I mean is, you create a repo file, you embed your public signature key into it, and then your build server signs all the PBIs it builds with that key, so we know which repository it matches up with. 
and then uh, we can add a repo to a system, and I have a GUI that does this too, and I'll show you that in a minute. Once you've added the repos from the system, you can browse all those repositories and say, cool, I wanna grab Firefox from Joe's repository or the official PCBSD repository or whoever it is, or FreeNAS will have a repository for their PBIs, and the PBI add command just knows where to look, where to grab it, it has a list of the mirrors for that repo, and it just does it. So it's just really easy to, to integrate this with other systems, especially like FreeNAS and whatnot, where they can run their own repo without having to reinvent the wheel, all the work's been done for them. Um, we have meta files that contain all the information, a master index of all the PBIs that just says here's the list of what's on the repo, and then the meta files will have information like what license is it under, what's the description, keywords, name, um, we have some translation support in there, so if you wanna translate Firefox's description into Japanese, we can do that, so if you're browsing it in Japanese, you'll get appropriate description. So yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. It definitely uh, fixes a problem we had in previous versions. And uh, as I mentioned, going hand in hand with the repos is digital signatures. We're using OpenSSL on this, which is in the base of FreeBSD, so we maintain that FreeBSD compatibility. During the creation, we're gonna go ahead and sign the archive and any scripts. Some PBIs use installation scripts, so a good example would be VirtualBox. It's a little more tricky than just Firefox. It has to load some kernel modules and put some things in to, to run when it boots up so we can do some of the networking. So it'll have a script that gets signed as well so we can verify nothing has been tampered with from the time it was built to the time you got it. And uh, all those signatures can be verified on your end user system. When you run the PBI add command, it'll check it, make sure it's good and you know, fail if not. And same thing with the GUI as well. And the last thing I had mentioned was binary patching or the problem of downloading a big PBI over a slow third world internet connection. You know, it really stinks if it's a 50 meg file and you know, it's gonna take 10 hours for me to get. So we had to come up with a way of making it quicker to download updates, especially since all the files are contained within them. A lot of times, most of the files aren't changing. It's just a couple ones from the new Firefox version, a couple new Firefox libraries, a binary, et cetera. The rest of the files are identical. So I came up with a system that allows us to build binary patches when you're building PBIs. And in this case, sometimes it's 95% reduction in the file size. So you'll have a small binary diff file that says I'm going from Firefox 4.0 to 4.01, and it's only 5% of the original size because only a few files have changed, and it knows which ones, and it uses the uh, BS diff and BS patch commands. These are FreeBSD. On FreeBSD, I don't know what the availability is on Linux, so this would be some of the stuff that would have to be ported. And uh, it uses those for generating and then patching binaries and libraries, et cetera. It auto-generates the patch files from ports, so the PBI system tracks the FreeBSD ports tree, which is where all the real work happens as far as the new Firefox hitting the tree or a new Thunderbird or whatnot. So when we see there's an update to the Firefox port, it builds a new PBI and auto-generates the patches for X number of versions in the past. So even if you messed a couple of updates, you can still jump up to the latest with the binary diff. And then auto fall back to full patching. So if you have a corrupted Firefox PBI or you've monkeyed with the files and the checksums don't match, it'll just fall back to the full file if it needs to as a backup. So that's all great and that's happening in the background, but if you're just an average user and don't really care about the command line, you know, what do I do? How does this help me? So we've written a new tool called the App Cafe. That's our new software management utility. It's Qt4 based front end and it's a front end of the PBI browser command, which is command line. So anything you see in these GUIs, you can do at the command prompt without ever firing up X even. You can run this on a system without X. It allows installing the applications as your user account and it's smart enough to know when certain apps need root. We've flagged it in the repository as this is a root app, so you'll need root permissions. It has support for browsing, managing repos, arranging and adding new mirrors. So if you're gonna run your own local PCBSD PBI mirror, you can just set it up to point to that and it'll default as the, uh, that is the first one. We have a tray icon that's integrated with it that'll just you know, warn you, hey, there's an update. You know, please install the update when you get a chance and all those little niceties the end users expect. And this is what it would look like, or looked like a couple months ago. We've, we've been updating a little bit since then. But uh, in this case, it's just a browser, and we have our categories. We have some of the latest releases, so you, we can kind of promo those up, up at the top. When you get to a category, browse through it and find Firefox, it gives us some information about it. In this case, it's already installed. We can do automatic updating on it, so if you check that, the daemon will actually monitor for updates and do the update in the background for you. you know, it tells you who the author is, what the license is, 
what platform, what version, et cetera, and then a description, which will be localized based on your language. Now, a neat thing I didn't mention about the platform is on AMD 64, we can run 32-bit stuff, right? But with PBI, since all the libraries are built in now, you can just download a 32-bit app and run it without touching anything else. So, Wine is not available on 64-bit natively. We just say, that's great, install the 32-bit Wine, and it just goes. Yeah, we don't have to do anything else, it just goes in its own directory and all its libraries are there, it's happy, it runs. So we have some neat little things we can do like that with apps that are not available in 64, like the, the you know, Super Nintendo emulators, Genesis emulators, those type of things that only compile on 32-bit for us. So after you've installed it, you, know, you can go into the Installed tab here and view what's there, and then bring up the, some options, you know, go back to the Details page or Install Desktop Icons if you deleted it and just want to get it back, or reinstall my menu icons, install them for all users, which will prompt you for your root password, and then we'll load it in the menu for all the users on the system, put it in the system uh, directory, and then of course uninstall. So I mean, that's, it's as basic as can be, and that's by design, we're trying to keep it simple. Another new feature we've added into Nine is something we call the Life Preserver. Um, it basically allows you just to back up. This is a just real simple backup tool which, and you can see we're pushing free now, it's just a tad bit here. You know, we love our cousins over there. But uh, anyway, it allows you to back up all your home data, all your user data to a remote server such as FreeNAS or anything running uh, rsync and SSH. So even a, a Linux box, anything that has those two pieces there, you can back up to. It's just an easy to use tray application. You just set it up with a host name, username, and it does all the key negotiation for you and sets it up so it's ready to do automatic backups. And then you say how often, daily or weekly, or don't back up, I'll do it when I want. And then it just goes ahead and fires it up using rsync over SSH, so you get encryption from end to end. And uh, it does all the incremental backups, et cetera. That's why we're using rsync. So once you do your initial backup, the, the extra backups after that are pretty quick, usually. And this is what this application looks like. I've already added a backup server, so I have a FreeBSD system at my house. I haven't done any backups, so, you know, it's not scheduled, et cetera. You just click start and it just goes. The icon tells you when it's done. I mean, it's just really point and click and try to make it as simple as possible. And the same thing with restores. Cool thing is I have my laptop I'm constantly changing, so I'm developing on it, right? So I'm blowing it away and loading new stuff and trying new kernels, et cetera. So I can load a fresh system, just hit the rsync server and say, yeah, restore all my data. Okay, come back 20 minutes later. Everything's back where it was. I'm happy. So very simple. So when is all this new exciting goodies coming? Well, PCBSD 9.0 is based on FreeBSD 9.0, so we're kind of tied to their release schedule. At this point, it's looking like late summer, or you know, possibly early fall. Their .o releases tend to get pushed back you know, as we get closer and closer, and people panic and go, oh no, I need to get this feature in. So you know, that's, that's the best guess I can give you, maybe September, October, et cetera. And uh, we're already rolling snapshots of this, though. So if you want to test this out, we just did a big snapshot for World IPv6 Day, which was an IPv6-only version of PCBSD. There's no IPv4 in it. So we rolled that out, and people are using this to test their IPv6 connectivity at home or at work or whatnot. So all those things are already up on our website, and you can get the pre-releases and just try it out. If you do, please just give me some feedback if you find bugs, et cetera, because this is still alpha quality and we're trying to polish it and just get it all knocked out before we get close to beta. So uh, that's all I have. Are there any questions? Yeah? Just in general, have you seen anything about security that's built in to in terms of hardening mm -hmm. or the on the OS and sure. on the firewall? Okay, so the question was what kind of hardening, security, firewalling are we doing? Well, out of box PCBSD is pre-configured with the PF firewall, which is from, you know, it's in FreeBSD, but that originated from the OpenBSD guys who are known for their security. So that's all on by default, and it's usually pretty restricted. There's only a couple ports open for allowing you to do Samba file sharing. I mean, that's about it. Um, as far as other hardening goes, the base system for FreeBSD is pretty hardened already. We don't have to turn on a whole lot of extra stuff. I think we have deny hosts running in the background, so if you fire up SSH, we can look for brute force attack attempts, et cetera. But uh, that's, that's about the bulk of it we've done. And so far, nobody's suggested anything better that we could do, because FreeBSD is pretty paranoid by default. <laughs> so we're just kind of piggybacking off of that. So, and that answer your question? OK. Any other questions? Yeah. 
What was that? Okay, yeah, the question was, are OS updates handled by the same FreeBSD update utility that's in FreeBSD? Uh, the answer is not now. We're exploring that for nine. That may be a possibility. The FreeBSD update utility, for those who don't know, is just an easy way to keep your kernel up to date and your world up to date for security advisories that come out, say, for FreeBSD 8.2. That'll help us, but it doesn't go the rest of the way. It doesn't do security updates with the packages. So we're investigating using part of that as our, our update solution for nine right now. It's not been, it's not finished yet or in a workable form in the uh, alpha ISOs, but that'll be part of it. We have to write the other end of it, which takes care of your packages still that are part of the base desktop. But uh, yeah, probably some form of that'll end up in nine. So, yeah. Oh, okay, the question was what partition format is preferred, ext4, et cetera. Well, ext4 is not an option. It's FreeBSD's options are UFS, has been their long-term file system. They've been using that for a while. In uh, 8.2, it's UFS with soft updates. In 9, it's UFS with soft updates and journaling. So no more long F6 after a crash. The other option is ZFS, and that was in the install GUI there. It's just a checkbox. You turn that on, it creates your ZFS pool. You can even go into advanced and add, you know, RAID and mirroring, et cetera, and it'll, it'll use those. But those are the two options, so ZFS and UFS, or some variety of that. And you can intermingle those at will. I will usually take a UFS boot partition and, and then uh, an encrypted ZFS partition or something for a laptop. So it's got an encryption layer on top of it. So if somebody steals my laptop, uh, they can't get into my data. Any other questions? Yeah. The question is, how is support for wireless devices? If you haven't used FreeBSD in a while, it was pretty kludgy there for a while, but it's getting much better. A lot of devices are just supported out of box, just work. Your Atheros, your Intel chipsets, uh, your raw link, et cetera. Um, it, it lags a little behind Linux, I'll be honest with you. I mean, there's, there's probably less developers working on it. But usually when the support gets added, it's, it just solid and works. But uh, you know, most systems today, you just throw it on there and it just works. It's, it's, you end up with an odd chipset here or there where we're still waiting for a driver from so-and-so to make it happen. But yeah, the wireless support has gotten a lot better if you've not used FreeBSD in the last couple of years. So. And uh, same thing as far as drivers goes. I, you know, honestly, one of the biggest things we see as a challenge on FreeBSD and PCBSD is dealing with drivers. You know, there's a lot of effort going into Linux drivers, say for the Intel for video or ATI or whatnot. Unfortunately, those are taking a very Linux-centric development route, which makes it difficult to port back to FreeBSD or Open or Net or whoever. And so we lag behind in a lot of those ways. Our preferred video right now is just NVIDIA. Honestly, we have a good working relationship with the NVIDIA guys. They release awesome binary drivers for our system, which uh, with this last release, we put some stuff into our kernel, which they said makes our performance equivalent to Windows in some ways, and uh, as far as just raw GPU power. So, you know, we've, we've had a good relationship with those guys, and we, we recommend their products because it just works. Out of box, you plug it in, it goes. So, yes? The question was, do we have CUDA support for BSD? And the answer is no, not now. Um, we can run it through the Linux emulation, I believe but we don't have native support, although yeah, it may change in the future. We'll see. I don't know what the status is on, on that, though. I'm not, I'm not involved with the development of that. So. Anything else, guys? Well, great. Thank you guys so much for coming, being a great audience. Appreciate it.
As a service leader in cloud computing, all we do is hosted computing. To us, the cloud is just the next generation of hosting. And as someone who's been in the hosting industry for 12 years, we feel we're in a unique position to really help bring these two worlds together, these different sets of technologies, and to help companies embrace this new world and this great new tool that allows faster innovation. Not only is it about us being responsive and accountable, but it's about us doing more for you. WebOS, an OS that works the way that you do. Across all your devices, HP Slate and WebOS, HP.